All right. Uh, I will use a uh, bilingual first uh, water. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. Terima kasih banyak uh, atas uh, kedatangannya, uh, adik-adik semua. Um, dan uh, sebentar. Uh, Oke, okay. ini adalah uh, kuliah dengan um, tema uh, regenerasi ya uh, yang akan dibawakan oleh Dr. Walter Nesling nanti. Uh, mungkin uh, saya akan bacakan dulu uh, CV-nya. So, uh, thank you very much, uh, Walter, for... <laughs> for your willingness to give a lecture here uh, in two classes, actually. One is for developmental biology students, and another one is for uh, regenerative uh, medicine or uh, also stem cell uh, class. So uh, we are really happy to have you here, and uh, uh, probably we, uh, probably our my students can interact with you later, and uh, but Uh, before, uh, let me first um, uh, read your CV. Uh, and yeah, so doctor or water wrestling PhD is now as a postdoctoral postdoctoral uh, staff in Research Institute for Molecular Pathology, IMP in uh, Vienna, Austria. So, uh, Dr. Masseling has held a long-standing interest in tissue morphogenesis and patterning. So, this is really, really developmental core of bi um, developmental biology. And during his post uh, doctoral study, I mean, uh, uh, the work is uh, was uh, provided a cellular explanation for. Uh, Toro Goods model of fin to limb transitions. Maybe later you can explain what is uh, Toro Goods. <laughs> And uh, Dr. Messeling identify a unique somatic, uh, somatic uh, population that infiltrates the apical ectodermal ridge. Uh, I hope this uh, term are really familiar to developmental biology students. Uh, including uh, apical ectodermal ridge to apical fold transition. And then uh, during his postdoctoral work, Dr. Messeling also switched uh, his focus to unique ability of axolotl appendages regeneration. Uh, and his contribution is that uh, he studied development and application of various techniques most notably the development and application of clearing strategy to brain bow label tissue. Wow, this is really nice, brain bow label tissue. Uh, and then uh, he also uh, able, was able to identify the presence of unique clonal ability of connected tissue cells to contribute to all lateral plate mesoderm lineage during limb regenerations. And uh, of course, uh, he got his PhD from Monash University, Australia Regenerative Medicine Institute. But before that, I met uh, Walter uh, in 2008-2009, yeah. Uh, Walter? Uh, 2009, 2010. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I'm not 2009. Sure. <laughs> yeah, a while ago. 2009-2010, uh, when I did my PhD, and uh, Walter is still a master's student from Utrecht University uh, under ad academic advisor, Professor Harun Den Hartog. I didn't know that you are, your supervisor was Harun. Yeah. Harun. Uh, did, did we talk about this before? Because I know him personally as well, actually. Well, yeah, I, I, I know you know him. I know All you right. know him. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> And then, of course, with uh, our uh, supervisor, Dr. Enan Lopez here. Okay. And uh, after uh, he got PhD, he, he got teaching associate in Monash University, Melbourne, Australia and then continue postdoctoral researcher at the RM, a RMI, Monash University, Melbourne, Australia. And then he moved to postdoctoral researcher at the Technische Universität Dresden 
Center for Regenerative Therapy Dresden, Dresden, Germany. And now he is a postdoctoral uh, researcher at the Research Institute for Molecular Pathology, Vienna, Austria. So um, once again, thank you very much for uh, your willingness to give a lecture today, uh, Walter. And I think I will give the floor to you now. Thank you. Please. Uh, that was a very uh, generous introduction. Makes it see make me seem much more important than I feel I am. But uh, <laughs> let's see. Where Gosh. Okay, share and then done. share. And now you should see my presentation. Is that correct? Yeah, that's clear. Okay, excellent. So, uh, with uh, what you mentioned in your very generous introduction, uh, the uh, lateral plate mesoderm and uh, rainbow labeling on and all of that good stuff. Uh, I'm not going to talk about any of that today. So I want to talk to you about uh, completely new work that, I, that we've been working on uh, more recently. And um, specifically, uh, this relates to the, again, still to the axolotl, of course. And specifically uh, how uh, we're now uh, using it as a unique model to study primary body axis regeneration, which in my mind it might be an even more striking feature of the axolotl than its ability to regenerate its limb. Now, all of this work is performed at the uh, IMP in Vienna. You can see that here on a uh, lovely uh, morning with the northern uh, Kalaberg in the background there. Uh, if you ever have a chance to visit, I would uh, thoroughly recommend it. Uh, so before we really delve into the uh, the research itself, uh, we need to briefly go over a little bit of background knowledge, really. So what is really important to note is that uh, animals don't have are either regenerative or non-regenerative. These Their regenerative ability uh, exists on a continuous scale. And across the animal kingdom, you can identify many, many animals that have some regenerative ability, some more than others. So for example, this crab would be able to regenerate its claw, which is pretty impressive for humans, but it pales in comparison to, for example, these flatworms, a uh, planaria. You can chop these into like 10, 16 different pieces and each piece would regenerate a complete new planaria. On the other extreme, for example, here there are some deer, which you should have in Indonesia as well, actually. Uh, they, uh, they're antlers, of course, they grow and uh, the males use them uh, during the mating season. Uh, they would lose them afterwards, and but then next year they would have regenerated again. Again, an example of regeneration may, and in an animal that otherwise you may not necessarily associate with being regeneration competent. Even in the case of humans, uh, we're often, we often consider humans uh, poor regenerators, but there are some examples of, of quite remarkable tissue regeneration also in humans. So uh, the most notable example, of course, being the ability of, the, of humans to regenerate their livers. So even a removal of 90% of the liver, a partial hepatectomy, uh, can fully regenerate and reestablish uh, the, a fully useful liver function. Uh, and then, of course, yeah, what we are really interested in is arguably uh, the king of regenerators, at least among vertebrates, uh, is uh, the axolotl. But we, in all of these examples, there are several core questions that we always think about. And I would like to uh, encourage you definitely to think about uh, similar questions. Any, whenever you run into an example of regeneration, these, to my mind, are really the fundamental questions uh, to ask. So first and foremost, what cells contribute to this newly regenerated tissue? Um, so furthermore, you need to ask yourself, or these cells need to know where they are. And with that, I mean, if an animal regrows, let's say, a limb, how does it know that it should grow back a limb and not a tail? But also, if you look at this on a more fine-grained level, 
if you need to regenerate only your lower arm and your hand, how do these cells know that they don't need to also form an upper arm? So of course, that's not something you'd like to do, right? So then you would end up with upper arm, lower arm, again, upper arm, lower arm and hand. We can artificially induce that in the lab, but if you want to properly regenerate a tissue, that is not something you want to do. And these questions, as at least the idea of how do cells know where they are, is something what we call positional identity, which is also very important. I won't touch upon it today, but if you have any questions about that, as I have to talk about it. And then furthermore, how do cells know when to stop regenerating? Uh, of course, again, let's talk about a limb regeneration example. If you want to regenerate one arm or one limb, you want to match it to the size of the other limb. So at some point, regeneration needs to stop, proliferation of these cells needs to stop. So how do these cells know how to do this and when, how do they read out the size of the original tissue or the tissue that's on the contralateral side of the body? And then finally, how is this patterning that you need to form, that you need to do, how is that reestablished? <clears throat> is this a problem of uh, recapitulating uh, the patterning process of development, or is this a completely independent uh, process? Uh, this is something that we're currently also investigating, uh, but not something that I've prepared for this presentation. If, also, if you have any questions about that, happy to talk about it. Uh, so in our lab, we tackle all of these types of questions in the axolotl. I mean, you've seen that picture already before. And this, and this salamander is native to Mexico. So just south of Mexico City, there are a couple of lakes and that's where they're uh, native to. They're incredibly rare in the wild and almost extinct, unfortunately. However, they're also very common uh, as a pet, actually, and they've been the uh, they've been kept in captivity for over 150 years and used as a laboratory animal for 100, over 150 years, which is actually uh, quite remarkable. Uh, these animals reach about 30 uh, centimeters in length and take 12 to 18 months to reach sexual maturity. And what uh, we find really remarkable about this animal is its regenerative ability, of course. We know that it can regenerate a wide range of tissues and body parts, so that includes its brain, uh, but also other regions such as its heart, its spinal cord, its limb, which is shown here, but also, of course, its forelimb. And uh, what I want to talk to you today about is the regenerative ability of its tail. Uh, basically, in short, uh, any tissue that you can injure on the axolotl and that doesn't kill it, it can probably regenerate. If you were to cut off its head, for example, you have a dead animal and obviously it can't regenerate anymore. Uh, so if we look at tail regeneration across evolution, uh, the axolotl is particularly remarkable as among the tetrapods, it is the only uh, animal that has the ability to completely regenerate its tail throughout life. So there are some other examples of tetrapods that can regenerate its tail. So frogs as tadpoles, uh, of course, they have a tail, but lose that as they undergo metamorphosis. Uh, lizards uh, are known to, well known to regenerate their tail. However, these animals do not pattern their tail. So this is not a complete regeneration. This is a very, uh, this is an incomplete and intermediate form of uh, regeneration. If you want to find any other examples of uh, complete tail regeneration, you need to look outside of the tetrapods. You can look into these really basal uh, fish, these uh, lungfish. And they are the, basically, they're considered the precursors to the uh, tetrapod uh, lineage. So if we have a look at axolotl tail regeneration in a bit more detail, you can see that here we have an axolotl tail in a nice stereoscopic view. And upon amputation, what happens is that a little bump of tissue forms called the blastema. 
And the stema contains all the cells that are necessary and sufficient to fully regenerate uh, the tail. Uh, and then upon regeneration, you can see that the complete uh, body is uh, reestablished. And what's very remarkable about this is that this represents an ability of this animal to regenerate 30% of its primary body axis while also reestablishing a complete patent tail. So this is unlike uh, uh, lizards that don't uh, reestablish this patent. So both the myotome and the vertebrae uh, reestablished. And in this presentation, I'd like to discuss the work we've been doing, trying to figure out which cells form this plastema and are thus responsible for the process of regeneration. But conceptually, there are two different ways by which a tissue can regenerate. So either through the de-differentiation of a committed progenitor, uh, which, so you have a committed cell, which then de-differentiates to form a progenitor, which then has the ability to contribute to various different cell types. Alternatively, you can imagine there's a model of expansion of a pre-existing progenitor that was set aside at some point uh, as, a ad as a unique adult uh, stem cell, if you will. Uh, again, these would have to proliferate and then contribute to various cell types. Uh, Previously, we've shown that in the case of axolotl limb regeneration, uh, we're actually dealing with the process of de-differentiation. So there's not some magical stem cell that's present within the limb. It is the loose connective tissue within the limb that undergoes uh, de-differentiation to form the blastema and contribute to uh, a broad range of uh, connective tissue uh, cells. We published that back in 2018. However, we still don't know what is the mechanism of uh, tail regeneration. So if you look at the tail in a bit more detail, you would see that the tail is made up of broadly two different uh, major lineage. So everybody of you who are studying developmental biology should be pretty familiar with this. So there's an ectodermal lineage, which is mainly made up of the epidermis and the spinal cord and neurons and the mesodermal lineages. Uh, most notably uh, of the mesodermal lineages are the uh, Semitic mesodermal lineages, which make up uh, the, the bulk. Uh, so that's the muscle and the muscle progenitors, the intermyotomal cells, or the myotonal junction, if you will, the vertebrae, and also the fin mesenchyme. Uh, considering how important the connective tissue is for limb regeneration, we set about to explore the contribution of these various connective tissue populations also to the regenerating tail. And to do this, we use a very classical Crelox lineage tracing approach. And briefly, we used a tissue specific promoter to drive the expression of tamoxifen inducible Cree. And upon exposure to tamoxifen, Cree is activated, resulting in the indelible labeling of these cells with M. cherry. So GFP is excised, and then we end up with a permanent labeling of these cells with M. cherry. And animals were treated 10 days prior to tail amputation, and then they were imaged every week for a total of six weeks uh, to uh, assess a complete regenerative response. So if we do this, we, uh, we started off with a col 1A2 promoter. col 1A2 is a broad mark of connective tissue. And that was a pretty good starting point to begin to identify a cell population that could be responsible for tail regeneration. And prior to amputation, you can see here, this is a uh, pseudocolored magenta. Uh, here we have a lookup table to make the weak expression cells a bit more obvious because there's a big difference in signal intensity. So you can see that there's a contribution to the vertebrae, blow up here, the fin, meson uh, the fin mesenchyme, but also the myotonal junction there. When we now amputate this tail and we wait for six weeks to observe the regenerate, uh, we again see that all major connective tissue populations are labeled. So in the blow up here, you can see that here, the vertebrae, the fin mesenchyme there, the intermyotomal cells. But interestingly, also there's some contribution to the uh, musculature, suggesting that these col 1A2 positive cells can also contribute to the myotome. Uh, effectively, this, uh, they therefore contribute to all somite-derived lineages uh, within the tail. 
We can therefore confidently say that whatever cell population is responsible for tail regeneration, it is uh, encapsulated by this broad connective tissue marker and must be present somewhere within this um, tissue. So that basically includes the pin mesenchyme, intermitum, motor cord, and vertebrae. Now that doesn't tell us much yet, but uh, it provides us a starting point. So to then further tease this apart, we generated another transgenic line using the twist three promoter. And during homeostasis, twist three levels a more uh, defined uh, population, specifically the nodal cord shown there, and also the fin mesenchyme blowups are shown here. And upon amputation and subsequent regeneration, we see that there's a very limited uh, ability of these cells to contribute uh, to the uh, regenerating tail only labeling a small proportion of uh, thin mesenchyme, basically. This suggests to us that the twist rate population does not contain the cells that are responsible for tail regeneration. We can therefore exclude uh, the notochord and also the thin mesenchyme as a likely source. This leaves us with the vertebrae and the intermyotomal cells as a uh, remaining candidate. So to assess uh, if vertebrae contain cells that are responsible for tail regeneration, we took a slightly different approach and we graphed the GFP positive vertebrae into a, a non-transgenic animal. We leave this animal to heal for a couple of days and then also we amputate right through the grafted vertebrae. When we uh, look at this uh, six weeks later, we see that there basically hasn't been any significant contribution to the uh, regenerating tail. Uh, the graft survived fine though, uh, but this suggests to us that the vertebrae also do not uh, contrib contribute significantly to the regenerating tail. We can remove that as well, leaving us effectively with this intermyotone population. So we really want to verify that this intermyotome population is indeed labeled because it's a very small and defined population. So we performed some electron microscopy and uh, that you can see here. So here are just some examples. So we uh, did some immunogold labeling of the cherry signal, which is shown here by these little black punctae. And what's interesting is that at the end of the muscle, you can see the muscle here, also, it's a blow up here. You can see this, here's the contractile apparatus, uh, very, very distinct. And then at the very end of the uh, muscle fiber, uh, where the, and you can see that there are these black punctae and they represent these connective tissue cells, these intermyotome cells. And indeed, you can even see that uh, collagen fibrils over here uh, provide a physical connection between the muscle and the uh, myotendinous junction, the MTJ shown here. So these are tendon-like cells, if you will. But, okay, so these cells are labeled uh, and they're there, great, but do they then represent a true progenitor or do they somehow undergo a blastema or injury-induced e-differentiation response, right? So to address this, we went back to the call 182 transgenic line, shown you this one before, which upon amputation contributes to all the connective tissue lineages uh, that are somi-derived, but also interestingly to the musculature. So we wanted to know if blastema formation was necessary for the ability of this line to contribute to the musculature. Uh, to address this, we switched to a local injury model, which heals without forming the blastema. And as you can see here, we, uh, upon local injury uh, 42 days uh, later, you can see that there is a uh, uh, the animal has healed, but also there's now a contribution to the musculature. The contribution of these cells to the myotome is therefore not dependent on blastema formation. Furthermore, what's particularly striking if we leave these animals to uh, just grow and we don't touch them at all, we can even see that in a homeostatic growth condition, these cells can also contribute to the musculature. Uh, this tells us that these cells have an intrinsic ability to contribute to the musculature 
independent of any type of injury at all, blasphema or otherwise. This and this to us is consistent with the ability of these cells of with the idea that these cells represent a resident progenitor and not a process of uh, de-differentiation. So to then further characterize this, we uh, took advantage of recent advances in RNA-seq. So what we can see here is a TSNE plot of a uh, RNA-seq experiment of the mature cherry positive cells in the axolotl tail the, in the col one population you can see that's a very diverse population that's labeled that's not hugely surprising uh, and if we look at specific markers we can identify broad, very broadly speaking three different lineages so you can see this kilotogenic lineage labeled by pkdcc and chidl1 you can also see that there's uh, prx1 and twist3 which labels the fin mesenchyme and a third population, which again makes perfect sense, uh, which is the supposed progenitors, which is labeled by sclerosis, which is a tendon marker, which makes sense if you're dealing with a, a tendon-like uh, population, but very uh, peculiar. There's also a labeling of these cells with uh, MEOX. And MEOX is not known necessarily to label tendon. Instead, it's more commonly uh, viewed as a a marker of the uh, pre-Semitic mesoderm. So it's a developmental marker, not necessarily a differentiated tendon marker. <clears throat> so to verify that these uh, factors are indeed expressed within uh, the MTJ, uh, we performed some HCR in situ. You can see that here in the mature tail, we performed longitudinal sections and then had a look uh, right between uh, the musculature there. And as you can see here, blow up shown here, there's uh, both uh, magenta and uh, green labeling. So the MEOX and the scleraxis signal are both present and co-localized at the right place in the MTJ. We can look at this also during regeneration. And as you can see here within the blastema, scleraxis uh, seems to be downregulated, but MEOX uh, persists. And then uh, as the tail undergoes regeneration, muscle segmentation is also reestablished. And you can see that uh, MEOX obviously is still there. Uh, Scleraxis as a marker of more differentiated tendon also uh, comes back. To fully understand this regenerative process, we also performed RNA-seq of uh, these different time points. So at one week and at two weeks, uh, actually also at uh, three months post amputation for a complete regenerative view. And what's really interesting to see uh, is that the mature, the one week, two week and three months post amputation population, they overlap to a very, very large degree. And this is different from what we saw during uh, during limb regeneration, where these populations seem to be more uh, separated based on their uh, regenerative time point. And we can see that there is a, that there's a supposed progenitor pool, as shown here, this somatic mesoderm-like pool is present here. And I should have the ability to contribute to the cartilage, the myogenic, the two dermal lineages, and also the fin mesenchyme. There are some other fibroblast-like cells that are present here that we haven't characterized yet, but they are not hugely important in this context. Well, what is very uh, striking is that these cells are labeled by uh, several factors, not just MEOX and scleraxis. We also see that there is expression of FGF8. Most people are probably familiar with FGF8 and also lunatic fringe. Now, lunatic fringe, uh, for those uh, aficionados uh, who like uh, somatogenesis, know that this is very important during somatogenesis. But that's not what we're talking about here. This is uh, expression uh, in both uh, homeostasis and uh, regeneration as a stem cell marker. 
So to verify that uh, this is indeed true, uh, we should be able to label these progenitors by generating a lunatic French transgenic animal. And that's exactly what we did. We took the mouse lunatic French promoter and uh, we used that to drive the expression of tamoxifen induced for free, just like we've done before. And these are actually very, very uh, fresh uh, results. Uh, we generated uh, last week. Uh, and what you can see here is that the uh, in, within the mature tail, we have a very sparse labeling of some cells. And it's also actually very, very weak. That's why you have that high background signal here. But what's really uh, exciting to us is that if you now amputate this tail and you look at the regenerative response, you can see a pattern that is highly reminiscent of the COL-1 population. Again, we now have a contribution to the musculature, a uh, contribution to the vertebrae, although you can't quite see it in this particular image, but also contribution to the uh, fin mesenchyme. And taken together, this allows us to conclude that the axolot of tail regeneration is dependent on a resident progenitor in the intermyotin, so these myotinal junction-like cells. These are tendon-like cells, but somehow they also have an ability to act as a uh, resident stem cell, which to us is very, very bizarre. So unlike limb regeneration, which is dependent on a process of de-differentiation of loose connective tissue to then establish the blastema and contribute to various connective tissue lineages. What I've shown you today, acts a lot of tail regeneration is dependent on cells within the intermyotome, which we call an asomitic progenitor. And we call it an asomitic progenitor because they, these cells are, have the same ability to contribute to the lineages that somites contribute to. However, during tail regeneration, no physical somites are formed. So calling them a somitic progenitor would not be correct. These cells undergo proliferation and they expand to establish the lastema and then contribute to all major uh, mesodermal uh, lineages, somitic mesodermal lineages. So the cartilage, i.e. the sclerotome, the intermyotome, uh, which you could look at as the dermatome, and the musculature, the myotome. So with that, I'd just like to <coughs> acknowledge everybody everybody else who contributed to this work. Uh, so um, the lab head, Eli Tanaka, uh, other people in the lab, uh, Priyak and Yuka particularly, who also contributed extensively. Um, people from other institutes in uh, Germany mainly, so in Leipzig and in Dresden, who contributed to the single cell work and the electron microscopy. Uh, our facilities, so the uh, sequencing facility, microscope facility, our excellent uh, team of animal caretakers who make us our lives 10 times easier. And uh, the entire lab, actually, uh, it's a really nice place to be. Uh, and of course, uh, the funding body, uh, the funding from the FW. And I'd like to thank you for your time and be happy to answer any questions you might have. All right. Thank you very much, Wato, for uh, excellent presentations. Uh, hopefully, <laughs> all my students uh, understand uh, a bit of the, uh, especially the transgenics, because maybe some of them are not really familiar with the transgenic uh, that you use for your study. But, okay. well, uh, if uh, they uh, ask, uh, maybe you can just answer it. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Right. Uh, ada pertanyaan? Any questions for the speaker? Please raise your hand and ask. Uh, bisa ditulis juga di chat, boleh? Gitu ya. Boleh uh, pakai bahasa Indonesia. Kalau masih malu-malu, nanti diterjemahkan, boleh? Silakan. Ada yang mau bertanya? Ayo. Jangan malu-malu. <laughs>
they are quite uh, shy actually. Uh, what? <laughs> Ayo, ada yang mau bertanya? Anything? Anything about the presentation from uh, Walter? Ayo. Wah, tidur nih kayaknya tadi ya. Kayaknya. <laughs> All right. Uh, okay. Um, maybe uh, before uh, they raise hand, uh, I will ask you. Uh, well, actually, to explain again how to how you make the the transgenic, and probably you can explain it a little bit, uh, Walter, about what uh, what is, uh, for example, uh, lunatic fringe, and then uh, you have colon, and then something like that. Uh, the designation for for transgenic is quite uh, specific, right? So maybe yeah. you can uh, explain it a little bit about it. Sure. So let me pull up the PowerPoint again. That's probably easiest. So if we All right, here we go. So the transgenes that we make, so we do that by injecting a bit of foreign DNA that we make in the lab, and we inject that into the uh, one cell stage, the freshly fertilized egg uh, of the axolotl. Uh, we uh, allow this DNA to integrate into the genome, and then you can make all sorts of uh, cool things. In this case, uh, what we do, we actually make a double transgenic animal. So we have a tissue specific promoter. So this can be any tissue that you can think of really. So this could be skin or bone or anything else where you know that this gene is uh, expressed within, specifically expressed in that tissue. We take the promoter for that gene and we use that to drive the expression of uh, Cree in this uh, case it's a uh, tamoxifen inducible Cree, uh, but Cree is really neat uh, because it has the ability to specifically cut at these uh, lock speed domains. These are specific DNA sequences that we can introduce into the genome. And then as it cuts there, it removes uh, this little bit of DNA, which in this particular case is uh, GFP. So that would be make a gene fl uh, green fluorescent protein and if we do that, uh, then you end up with uh, the removal of GFP. So in a default case, you're dealing with a ubiquitous promoter that drives the expression of GFP, but it doesn't express cherry. And then upon uh, pre uh, activity, this is removed and you end up driving the expression of M cherry instead. So effectively uh, what we have here is a way to permanently label specific cell populations uh, where the default state is GFP. And then if these cells have ever been exposed in their history or their, uh, their precursors have been exposed uh, to pre-activity, uh, they should be labeled with m -cherry instead. Sure. So this way, this is a way to perform tissue level uh, lineage tracing. All right, thank you very much, uh, Walter. And uh, okay, there is uh, one question from uh, the students. Gesan, please uh, open your video and you can ask. And then Alfina. Gesan? Oh, okay, uh, good afternoon, sir. Yeah, good afternoon. <laughs> um, so I would like to ask you something. Hello. Hmm. I thought, uh, uh, putus putus. Uh, I think it's disconnected. Sorry, Walter, for the. <laughs> I think in Indonesia the signal. Technical difficulty. <laughs> yes. All right. <laughs> okay, yes, and putus. Yeah. Okay. Uh. Uh. She's entering the room again. Wait a minute. Hello, Gesen. 
Hello? Sorry, yeah. I was disconnected. Yeah, that's all right. Okay. <laughs> um, so actually, uh, I grow an axolot at my home. Oh, and <laughs> Yeah. Uh, and I've, I've read about it, uh, that um, it couldn't grow its gills. Is that right? I mean, like, sorry, pakai bahasa Indonesia dulu juga. Uh, boleh, 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 boleh. Apakah hanya tail dan limbsnya aja gitu yang bisa uh, regenerationnya baik gitu? Karena okay. dengar-dengar sih, the gills are like um, kind of hard to regrow itself. All right, all right, all right. So uh, the the main questions actually. It, Is there any difference uh, capability of uh, uh, regeneration in axolots? Uh, because she said that he, she heard uh, if gills is quite difficult to uh, regenerate uh, different from the tails and also the the limbs. Yeah. Mm, well, the, the, so let me preface this by saying that of course we don't know the molecular or the cellular mechanism that is responsible for gill regeneration mm -hmm. if you house animals properly gills should be able to regenerate that we know but that's purely uh that's purely an observational study we do not understand the uh, cellular basis for uh, gill regeneration should also be very, very made very clear that uh, the gills are kind of important for the animal, right? So if you injure the gills or if the gills are injured too much, uh, then that will be detrimental to the health of the animal. And an animal in poor health uh, won't be happy and won't regenerate as well. Just like if, uh, If you don't uh, sleep well or you don't eat well, you don't grow well either. S same thing applies uh, to the axolotl in this regard. All right. All right. Thank you. Gimana, Kesan? Okay. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Uh, so, uh, it, like in, is it is it true that in in axolotl as well have uh, uh, really uh, great Uh, capability of regeneration uh, similar to the fish, jabra fish, for example, uh, water? Uh, axolotl have more extensive regenerative ability than the zebra fish. Oh, okay. So, uh, so the zebra fish, uh, sure, they can regenerate that, what they say, the tail, for example, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but that's only the tail fin that does that. The tail fin is not the, in this case, the uh, Semitic lineage. It's not segmented tissue uh, by the, it's not segmented through semitogenesis. In the case of the axolotl, you can uh, amputate everything up to the cloaca mm -hmm. and that can completely regenerate. Uh, there are no vital organs there. The animal can still uh, uh, regulate uh, its uh, uh, body fluid composition, uh, can still uh, excrete Uh, so as long as it can do that, uh, it can regenerate. If you were to do the same thing to a fish, you would end up with a dead fish. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Watson. So uh, there is one question from Alfina Putri. Do you want to ask yourself your questions or I read it for you, Alfina? Please. Uh, Alvina is here. Oh, my connection is bad, so I, I will read it for 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 Alvina. Okay, so uh, I would like to ask: Is there any procedure on how to amputate animal tail or fin? Because I'm doing research on fish tail regeneration, but there is no progress for one of my fish. Thank you. I think it's well, quite a similar answer, but, but you already uh, been, uh, answered. But yeah, you can answer. Uh, so uh, tail regeneration, fin regeneration as well. Uh, in most cases, uh, for in the axolotl at least, what we do, we take a scalpel blade or even a, just an ordinary razor blade and we just 
cut. Uh, this is, of course, after the animal is put uh, under with anesthetics and analgesic, so you don't hurt it too much as you do the amputation. Uh, and then after that, the animal just goes back into its tank and it seems to be just fine. Uh, if you're dealing, uh, in the case of uh, limb regeneration, this might be interesting to mention, uh, is that uh, after you amputate uh, a limb, the soft tissue that surrounds the bone would uh, contract a little bit, leaving the, uh, the long bone within the limb uh, exposed. And you don't want to do that. So you want to, after you amputate it, again, using a normal scalpel or razor blade, uh, you want to trim back uh, the bone a little bit with some uh, very, very fine scissors or even, again, the same uh, scalpel blade. But also after that, uh, the limb should regenerate just fine. Um, if you're dealing with an animal that uh, should regenerate, but somehow is not regenerating, uh, I wouldn't worry too much about the injury, about what you have done to it. It's, you've probably not done anything wrong. I would look for either a maybe there was a weird mix up in your in your animals maybe one was uh supposed to be regeneration incompetent and that's just the one that you amputated and something got mixed up there that could be the case or uh there is a uh, something in the water there's an environmental aspect here uh that you can look at um, or heck um uh, Biology is messy and biology is weird. Sometimes things just don't behave the way they should. And that also happens. Uh, also happens to us. Sometimes an animal dies when it's not supposed to or uh, it doesn't regenerate quite the way it's supposed to. But if you make sure that you have enough N numbers, this really shouldn't be a major problem. But it's, it's probably not something that uh, you did wrong. Uh, this is uh, probably just uh, the messiness of biology in general. <laughs> All right, thank you, uh, Walter, for the answers. So, yeah, uh, Alvina, uh, you don't have to worry uh, much about your fish because it's how many fish do you use actually? Because it's only one from, for example, 10, then it's fine too for experiments, biological and experiments, I think, and um, some external factors also could uh, affect your uh, experiments like uh, uh, Dr. Walter said, okay? So uh, we move to the next uh, uh, question from Fiana. Uh, Fiana, do you want to ask yourself the questions? Or I also have to read it for you. You can type it. Okay, so uh, Fiana, uh, I would like to ask two questions. The first one, is there a functional difference between regenerated tail and a previously uncut tail? A uh, very good question, very good yeah. question. <laughs> and the first one, and then the second one, do all axolotl have the same regeneration time of 42 days? Uh I'll answer the second question first. Yeah. Uh, no, no, they do not. Uh, this is very much dependent on the tissue that you injure. Some things can grow back faster than other things. But it's also dependent on the age and the size of the animal. Uh, a smaller, younger animal will be able to complete its regenerative response uh, faster uh, than a larger, um, older animal. So in our case, we use uh, relatively small animals that we started off with, so three, four centimeter. Uh, so th this is a relatively uh, fast regenerative response uh, that we're looking at. Although in comparison to, for example, planaria or zebra fish or any other animal that uh, would regenerate uh, 42 days is of course uh, forever. Uh, yeah, these are very, very uh, long-term experiments compared to uh, what some other people are doing. Um, as to your first question, uh, I'm, I'm glad you asked this. Uh, this gives me the opportunity to talk about uh, the patterning of the axolotl tail. 
So yes, the uh, there is a complete functional recovery of uh, the tail. Uh, in a lizard, when you amputate the tail, uh, you end up uh, regenerating the tail, uh, but there is no segmentation. So there's one big uh, rod of cartilage and bone uh, that forms. And for the lizard, that's fine because the, the tail in a lizard is mainly used as a counterweight to help it uh, jump and move on land. The axolotl, on the other hand, is an aquatic animal and it uses its tail to swim. So if you were to poke an axolotl, uh, you would see that uh, it has an escape response and the tail just undulates like that. Uh, and if you want to do that, well, you can't have one straight rod of bone in your regenerator tail. So indeed, when we do this type of uh, analysis, on the axolotl, so both the uninjured tail and the fully regenerated tail, uh, they can nicely undulate uh, during the escape response. We can also look at this using Alcin blue, alizarin red staining, which labels the cartilage and the bone in the in the entire animal, and we don't see any uh, any difference really as far as that's concerned uh, in the uh, both the uninjured and the fully regenerated tail. So yeah, this is a very, very remarkable uh, process uh, by which the vertebrae are reestablished. And it, I should point out that this is, especially for those of you who uh, like developmental biology, um, somatogenesis, uh, the process of these epithelial balls throughout the embryo is essential to form vertebrae. They inform the vertebrae pattern during embryogenesis. Uh, during tail regeneration, we still form these vertebrae the same way. However, or at least the end result is the same, but the mechanism has to be different. There are no so much that are present, nor are any molecular markers that we commonly associate with so much present. So, present. so TBX18, UNGS, we specify the different uh, parts of the somite, uh, the rostral and caudal identities. They are not present either, but despite all of that, the vertebrae can somehow still form. And this is still something that we're very much looking into. So uh, we're still trying to figure out how that is actually possible. Right. right. Thank you very much, Walter. Uh, all right, we still have time now. Uh, any other questions, please? Come on. Vienna, okay, thank you. Uh, it's very nice answer. Thank you so much, she said. <laughs> to you, uh, okay, uh, next questions, please. Anyone? So uh, regarding the stem cells, uh, Walter, mm -hmm. uh, is there, any contributions for the regeneration in absolute, uh from from stem cell point of view or so, sorry come again yeah uh, is there any uh, contribution from uh, stem cells or progenitor cells uh, sure, in these sure. uh, tail regenerations yeah yeah so uh, tail regeneration is a pretty complicated uh, process so what we've done uh, in the, the work that I've just presented, th that there is a uh, progenitor that has the capacity to contribute to all major uh, lineages that are classically uh, Semitic mesoderm derived. So that is myotome, uh, sclerotome, uh, and uh, how are of course, other more lineage restricted uh, progenitors, these images that uh, during regeneration, the, the ventral domain, so the back of uh, the, the dorsal domain, sorry, is uh, labeled nicely uh, by these different transgenic lines. So call one and lunatic fringe, uh, they label uh, one part of the musculature. Uh, the other part of the musculature is still formed. Uh, it is just uh, not contributed to by this particular population. 
So there is a more lineage restricted uh, progenitor that is present that contributes to the rest of the uh, musculature, which is a more common uh, PAC7 positive uh, satellite cell like uh, muscle progenitor that contributes to the regenerating tail. Uh, whereas the uh, Finn mesenchyme, uh, for example, also contains uh, probably more lineage restricted progenitors. Yeah. Sorry, I can't. Yeah, not here. Sorry. Uh, and then for the RNA seq that you uh, uh, presented here, uh, which samples do you use, uh, Walter? The plasma so or? Uh, yeah, so we used uh, several different populations. So there was the uninjured tail. That was right. the, the one week post amputation, the two week post amputation. So those are blastemas. Yeah. And then we used a tissue that was fully regenerated at three months. Uh, all of it should be noted though, that these tissues were all, uh, we sorted uh, these cells for uh, the, uh, own, to collect only the cherry positive population. So from this pole one line, we only collected the cherry positive population. So this is a single cell uh, level? Yes, single cell RNA-seq uh, using the 10X platform. Yeah. Wow, okay. We also, okay. we also did some comparison to the, to the embryo. So we have various embryonic data sets using a more conventional uh, uh, SmartSeq approach, uh, mainly because uh, the axolotl embryos have such massive cells. The cells are so big that they are not compatible with the 10X platform. So we use a SmartSeq platform instead. Uh, there we manually, individually, we manually pick individual cells out of the embryo, which is, takes some time, but you can get it done. Of course. So, but how many cells uh, do you usually use for three cells for, for individual? Uh, uh, for the 10X, we probably have about, probably 20,000 cells per sample. Oh, okay. And in the, in the embryonic data set was a bit more moderate. There we had, uh, let me see, must have been, so there were three conditions, two plates per condition. So that was uh, what, 600 cells, 700 cells in total. So mm -hmm. that was very much, uh, very, very uh, much uh, smaller. But you have to keep in mind, these cells you pick uh, manually, you don't, uh, this can be done massively paralleled. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> and then you isolate the RNA from there, all right? Yeah, yeah. All right, all right. Okay. And then uh, still about the uh, first uh, slides that you saw about the questions, uh, mm -hmm. actually, the, so, uh is it can, can it be uh i mean uh is it conserved among the vertebrates that the patterning uh stop like you already explained or there is a specific um a pet wave in different vertebrates for the for the I'm, I'm yeah, I'm not quite sure I understand. So so the your your questions uh, in the beginning is that how they stop uh, regenerating, right? How, how yeah. they the <laughs> cells you know it comes yeah. down to size control. Yeah. All right, all right. So, so this is my control question. Mm -hmm. So in uh, further braids, do they have similar? Yeah, one moment. Oh, sure. People want to use this room. I can. We can move somewhere else. No problem. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Uh, ah. Hi. Uh, I can. I can do that. That's fine. Okay. Yeah. 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 That's fine. I can do that. No worries. We're gonna go on a little hike. I'm gonna sit somewhere else. People have this room book. All right. All right. All right. Is it okay, Walter? Yeah, oh, we yeah, can... yeah, no, that's quite all right. I'm happy to keep talking. Just need to all right. move. Uh, let's see. 
that's all right. Let's go over here. There we go. All right. Yeah. All right. Right. Yeah. Better. Is it okay now? Yeah. It's okay now? Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, we have one question still from Gason uh, in the chat. Uh, why axolotl are more resistant to cancer than any animals? Yet yeah, they have the ability to regenerate almost everything that cut off their body. Yeah, good question. Good question. So I'm not sure if axolotls are completely uh, resistant to uh, to cancer. We have some animals that have some abnormal growths. Uh, I think it's uh, mainly a question of why of looking close enough. If you look closely enough, you will find axolotls that would have uh, some cancer-like growths as well. Uh, but uh, still, I agree with you, the prevalence is uh, much lower than you would otherwise expect, especially in an animal that seemingly contains these massive, uh, contains these interesting stem cells and can continuously proliferate. That should be a huge boost for any uh, type of uh, cancer to form, uh, and it isn't. Uh, this also comes down to the, uh, there's some uh, interesting work being done uh, by some groups in Dresden at the moment on this uh, specific question. When you think about an animal that can continuously regenerate, uh, you can repeatedly amputate any structure and it's a small population of cells that proliferate there has to be some depletion of the telomeres. The telomeres have to shorten, right? And they don't. So that would suggest they contain uh, telomerase, which is, of course, um, as the questioner probably know, uh, appreciates as well, is one of the hallmarks of cancer formation. So that's something that the, the Andes, uh these colleagues of ours interested and looked at, and it turns out they uh, they don't have telomerase. Uh, the telomeres do not get shorter. It is a completely different process of telomere lengthening uh, that these cells uh, use. Uh, so there are some uh, ways in which the axolotl can uh, maintain its ability to proliferate uh, these cells uh, without. Um, shortening its telomeres through a telomerase independent mechanism and therefore bypassing the uh, the potential to induce uh, cancer formation. Cannot hear you. Yeah, sorry. Yes, and how is it, the answer? Yeah, it's okay, right? All right, uh, maybe, uh, think interesting, thank you very much, she said. <laughs> So, uh, what uh, uh, you said that there is a uh, differentiation and also uh, proliferation uh, happening in the limb. In, this, yeah. in the limb. In the limb. In the limb. Yeah. Uh, what? Yeah. If, okay. What about in the tails? Uh, can you explain it again? In the tail, it's a. It, in in the, So we think that there are two different mechanisms. So, uh, within the within the limb. Uh, we're dealing with a process of uh, de-differentiation. So there are, we identify a pool of loose connective uh, cells, uh, loose connective tissue cells, and they undergo de-differentiation. They, uh, as, during homeostasis, they do not contribute to any other lineages and they do not express uh, embryonic genes. Uh, uh, upon amputation, uh, these cells then form uh, the blastema. They lose their the expression of differentiated uh, 
the differentiated identity and they turn on more a more embryonic like program uh, and then they contribute to all connective tissue lineages in contrast in the tail we're dealing with the uh, cells that sit at the myotendinal junction so these are tendon like cells although it should should be noted that even during homeostasis they contribute uh, to uh, growing tissue uh, so most notably the musculature and tendon is not supposed to contribute to the musculature and that we found very very weird and that was very striking actually uh, furthermore if you look at uh, if you look at these cells at a at a more molecular level you would see that even during uh, homeostatic growth there is an expression of these uh, embryonic like uh, genes so fgf8 meox lunatic fringe these are expressed in the resident uh, cells uh, without any type of injury uh, which uh, would suggest that these cells are a resident progenitor now of course if you really want to show this sorry you might have to do some more experiments but we're pretty convinced by this yeah all right all right right thank you very much uh walter i think uh yeah i think that's it uh walter uh once again thank you very much for your time uh and very very nice work you have done so far with this uh, tail regenerations uh, hopefully uh, well if i ask you again to give a lecture you <laughs> you're willing <laughs> again all right that uh, should so be possible sure yeah 